Hello, this is David, <coughs> and in this clip, I'm going to do an egregiously oversimplified reduction of gallstones and some of the biology that's sort of necessary to understanding the formation of gallstones and part of hepatobiliary disease. So, just to review, imagine this is your liver, here's your liver, and the liver has a right lobe and a left lobe. And there's, of course, ducts into the liver, your right hepatic duct and your left hepatic duct that interconnect to the hepatic parenchyma through small bile canaliculi that ultimately join and form the right hepatic duct, the left hepatic duct, and then the common hepa hepatic duct. The common hepatic duct has a sort of a draining reservoir called the cystic duct that could open into the gallbladder. And the gallbladder could store bile and then squeeze and, and then like distend, distend and store bile. And then when the bile is needed, let's say after a meal, it could contract and squeeze the bile through the common bile duct into D2 or the second part of the duodenum. And that's really, so bile is produced by the liver and stored by the gallbladder and secreted, so, or sort of squeezed really, expressed by the gallbladder into the common bile duct and into the ampulla vater, which is sort of the end of the common bile duct and which often conjoins with the pancreatic duct, Worsang and Santorini, the, the, the main and the accessory pancreatic duct at D2, at the level of the duodenum. But, as you well know, sometimes a stone could form within the gallbladder and that could cause symptoms and it could cause all sorts of trouble. And depending on where the stone impacts within the system will determine on the class of the disease that the patient gets. Now, before discussing the various clinical situations, the various clinical contexts, let's just discuss for a second the chemistry of the formation of that stone. And that will be the main concept of this clip will relate to the various chemistries that occur in the contents here, the contents of this bile and that's stored in the gallbladder and that's ultimately excreted. What are the chemical constituents and then how might they form various types of stones? So with regard to the question of what's in the bile, the answer is, the first answer I would say is cholesterol. There is cholesterol secreted by the liver into the bile, so there's cholesterol. There's also um, a product called bile acids, which is a kind of a detergent that the liver makes. And the real reason what the liver does, it's a detergent that the liver makes out of cholesterol, out of the destruction of cholesterol, or out of the metabolism of cholesterol, it creates these various detergents that are called bile acids. And they're used to form micelles, which are helpful in the reabsorption of fat, but it's also a point of elimination of cholesterol from the body. And, and they go by names like cholic acid, kinodeoxycholic acids, those are your bile acids. So we spoke about cholesterol, we spoke about bile acids. There's another kind of detergent that I don't know much about. In fact, I don't even know how to spell it. And it's called lecithin. And then there's another product that has nothing to do with cholesterol metabolism that's called bilirubin. That's a heme degradation product that also gets into bile. And this is what gives bile its color, that characteristic color of bile, that yellow sort of fluorescent -y color. It's not, it doesn't come from the cholesterol or any of the cholesterol metabolites. It comes from here. It comes from the bilirubin degradation. And so these are the main constituents. And these different constituents could play a role in the formation of stones. So before we discuss the formation of stones, let's just go into these different chemical constituents in a little bit of detail, because they could get a little confusing. And the main point I want to do in this clip is to make sure that the student does not confuse bilirubin from bile acids. So once again, let's just look at this in a little bit more detail. What's bilirubin? Bilirubin is, as we said, a degradation product of, he of heme. It's a degradation product of red blood cells and what's, it's what give bile its color. The way that's made is you have red blood cells in your circulation and they break down and they release their heme pigment. The heme pigment is picked up by macrophages that convert it to a product called biliveridin and ultimately to a product called bilirubin and at this point the bilirubin is unconjugated. It's not attached to anything. That unconjugated bilirubin attaches to albumin in the blood and floats to your liver, goes to your liver. The liver picks
breaks up that albumin bilirubin combo and adds a molecule to it called glucuronide, and that's called glucuronidation. And it's at that point that your liver excretes the bilirubin, so now it's conjugated. The glucuronidation is a conjugation step. It renders the bilirubin water-soluble, and that allows it to go into the bile. So now this conjugated, glucuronidated, conjugated bilirubin now goes into your bile here, um, and, 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 and ultimately enters your second part of your duodenum and gets into your intestinal tract. In your intestinal tract, there are bacteria that deconjugate, that take off this glucuronide, that deconjugate the bilirubin, and that bilirubin is passed into stool, and that, that's your stercobilins, your stercobilins, sterco for stool. But some of that deconjugated bilirubin gets back into the bloodstream, and ultimately gets secreted in the urine, and that's what's called your urobilin. But that's not so important. What's really important here is that th the first part of the step, the first part of the step, the elimination. So you could imagine, for example, that if you have an obstruction, any kind of obstruction to your extrahepatic or even your intrahepatic um, biliary tree, as long as, especially if it's your extrahepatic biliary tree, especially if it's after the conjugation step, especially if it's after this bilirubin becomes conjugated, so any obstruction to your extrahepatic biliary tree will lead to a rise in conjugated bilirubin in your blood because the, the conjugated bilirubin bl backs up and goes into your system. So, that now explains why obstruction causes this conjugated bilirubinemia. So, I'm presenting this a little out of sequence, a little non-discursively, but you'll see it'll all tie together. So, one of the constituents, just to review, that your liver puts into your bile is conjugated bilirubin that it makes out of heme degradation products that arrive to the liver as unconjugated bilirubin bind to albumin and then gets glucuronidated or conjugated and poured into the extrahepatic biliary tree by way of your hepatocellular canaliculi, which are these little ducts between your hepatocytes, and they ultimately find their way to their right and left hepatic duct. So that is your bilirubin. Now, <coughs> we spoke about another major the another, so the other major party of elements that are present in your bile are your cholesterol metabolites. And these include cholesterol itself, and your bile acids, and another detergent called lecithin. So, cholesterol, that's relatively simple. There's some cholesterol present within the bile. Well, what are these bile acids? The bile acids, as we said before, are a conversion product that your liver makes out of cholesterol that are water-soluble, and that your liver makes them and pours them into the bile. And these are really detergents. So they're made by the liver, these bile acids, and they have names like cholic acid and ketodeoxycholic de acid. They're made out of cholesterol, and what they do is they go into the gut and they allow my cells to form. They allow these sort of, you know, droplets to form that en enables fat to get into the gut. They're like these detergents, and they solubilize the lipid that you eat and enables fat-soluble products to get into the gut. But then, you need these detergents back, and these are reabsorbed in the ileum. These are reabsorbed back in the ileum. So there's a lot of outcomes for this, so I'm just going to jump out again to give you a few clinical pearls. So if somebody has a resection of their ileum, if somebody loses their ileum, if somebody loses a lot of ileum, for example, secondary to Crohn's disease, then they c this pathway of secreting these bile acids and then getting them back in the ileum, ileum is called the enterohepatic or enterohepatic circulation. And if you lose your terminal ileum, or if you lose a lot of your ileum, it could impair your enterohepatic circulation. And what that could do is it could enable, it could sort of decrease your amount of bile acids and decrease your ability to form my cells and ultimately to absorb fat. And that's why people with short gut, especially if there's a lot of ileum missing, develop steatorrhea and fat loss. And they could even become low in fat-soluble vitamins such as A, D, E, and K.
and therefore could become coagulopathic because vitamin K is involved in, as you know, the coagulation cascades. So the reason why people who are missing a lot of ileum, for example, could become coagulopathic is because their enterohepatic circulation, their enterohepatic system is disrupted, they have diminished bile acids, they develop steatorrhea, and they basically have a malabsorption of fat, thus losing fat-soluble vitamins. We also use this enterohepatic circulation for people with hypercholesterolemia, because as I mentioned, these bile acids are a drain for cholesterol. It's a way of the liver to eliminate cholesterol. The bile acids are a drain for cholesterol. So we could put a drug called cholestyramine. We give patients a drug we used to, especially before we developed the statins. We could give patients a drug called cholestyramine that binds to the bile acids and basically makes a patient eliminate gut in their stool, eliminate bile acids in their stool. The, the cholestyramine binds tightly to the bile acids and doesn't allow it to be resorbed <coughs> in the ileum. So the patients develop a steatorrhea. They, 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 they lose fat in their stool, and specifically what they're losing is a cholesterol product. So they make more bile acids, and then that gets eliminated, again, by the cholestyramine. So a way of eliminating, one way of eliminating cholesterol, one strategy is to give the patient cholestyramine, and that could be used to correct hypercholesterolemia. The problem with that drug is, as you could anticipate, it gives the patient steatorrhea, it gives the patient fat malabsorption, and also potentially you could get the other complications of fat malabsorption, such as deficiencies in vitamin A, D, E, and K. So now, let's go back to the gallbladder. So we're talking about the gallbladder, and we now know what our constituents are. We have this host of cholesterol metabolites, your bile acids, your, in other words, your kinodeoxycholic acid, and your col cholic acid and, and their various um, <coughs> relatives, and then you have cholesterol itself and lecithin, and they exist in various concentrations. So a lot of books represent it as a triangle, your lecithin, your cholesterol, and your bile acids, and they have to be in the right concentrations. And if the concentrations of these constituents are off, things could begin to crystallize, things could begin to precipitate. And that forms a kind of stone that's called a cholesterol stone, or it could be a little bit not so pure, and we call it a mi mixed stone. But the pathogenesis of the formation of cholesterol stones has to do with this triangle, with the elements of this triangle being off, the concentration of lecithin, cholesterol, and bile acids not being right, and that could form a stone, a cholesterol stone, or a so-called mixed stone. The other kind of stone that you could get, which is much more rare, is a bilirubin stone. And that is, if there's a lot of conjugated bilirubin in your gallbladder, that could congeal and that forms a stone. But these stones, because remember, the bilirubin has color. The bilirubin is pigmented. So that would form a darkly pigmented stone. So the cholesterol stones tend to be yellow. They tend to be multifaceted. They have um, many, many shapes. Whereas the uh, bilirubin stones tend to be a little bit smaller, they tend to be dark and slightly rounder. And so those are your bilirubin stones. They're small and dark and round, where your cholesterol stones could be quite large. They have various components of calcium in them, and they often are multifaceted and they're softer. So, once again, just to review one more time, two main types of stone, cholesterol stones, which are formed through this pathway, meaning uh, abnormal concentrations of the balance of lecithin, cholesterol, and bile acids. That's type 1 of stones. And another type of stones are your pigment stones that are formed from bilirubin. The two stones representing the two major families of things that you find in the bile. So now let's imagine that a patient has a any kind of stone, one of the two kinds of stone, and the stone impacts. And the stone impacts, let's say, at the cystic duct. It's too big and it can't get out, and it impacts at the cystic duct. Well, your gallbladder wants to squeeze, and it starts squeezing against this stone, and it's squeezing and trying to push out the bile, but it can't. Well, what the kind of pain that that causes is a visceral pain. It's a visceral pain because it's vague. There's no inflammation yet. It's a visceral pain. And that's the pain of this stone, and that's what we call coledoco... Sorry, I made a mistake. Sorry, that's what we call cholelithiasis gallstones, cholelithiasis. And when you have just cholelithiasis, just stones, what will usually happen is, the stone will be sitting here, but 
nothing will happen, but then you'll eat a fatty meal. And the hormones produced, like things like cholecystokinin, which are things that your int intestinal system produces after a fatty meal, telling the gallbladder, give me some bile, help me absorb the fat here that's in the gut. The gu it'll make the gallbladder squeeze, but it'll squeeze against this stone. And that squeezing that will cause pain because it's now distended and the stone is impacted. But nothing is inflamed yet. It's just a... The, just the pain of contraction of a viscous. So, as I said on previous tapes, the pain of contraction of a viscous is a visceral pain. It's a vague pain because the visceral system is vaguely innervated. So what that gives you is it gives you pain right here in your epigastrium. So epigastric pain following about 15 to 30 minutes following a fatty meal with a waxing and waning colicky course goes with cholelithiasis. But as that gallbladder starts to get inflamed, and it starts to get red and angry, and it starts to, and it even then develops like a serocytus, the outside of the gallbladder gets inflamed, and then you get a visceral um, peritonitis, and then even a parietal peritonitis in the wall of the lining of the gut overlying the gallbladder, then the pain will localize, and it'll localize here at Murphy's Point, especially if you could somehow press it by getting the patient to breathe in and out, and if you could capture it. And at that point, there may be some features of systemic inflammatory response. So, the two main things that we just I just want you to remember from this is how gallstones are formed, and that the presence of gallstones is called cholelithiasis. And when that gallstone ultimately causes true inflammation of the gallbladder wall, we call that cholecystitis. And cholecystitis could be acute, it could be acute, it could be the throes of pain secondary to an impacted stone, but often what happens is the stone will eventually pass and then you'll get another stone, and that'll eventually pass. And what you really then get is this chronic inflammatory situation set up in the gallbladder. So you get a thickened gallbladder wall and certain abnormalities of the architecture of the wall, and that's what we call chronic cholecystitis. So cholelithiasis is gallstone disease. Usually we're talking about the gallbladder. Cholecyst cholecystitis is inflammation of the gallbladder. Purely speaking, the visceral pain should be vague, it should be um, epigastric, and it should be waxing and waning, but then when you get a true cholecystitis, when you get true inflammation, the pain begins to localize to the right upper quadrant a little bit more. And that's, and usually, usually, if it's pure gallbladder disease, without the stone getting anywhere else in the tract, without the stone getting anywhere here, without the stone getting anywhere else in the tract, if it just, if the buck stops here, then usually you shouldn't get any significant abnormalities in blood work, apart from if you have a severe acute cholecystitis, you could get some, a systemic inflammatory response with things such as an elevated white count, but that's unusual. So usually you'll just basically get the clinical symptoms and then an ultrasound will show the presence of the gallstones. And that's gallstone disease of the gallbladder. In our next clips, we'll discuss what happens when stones get elsewhere, elsewhere into the tract. Thank you so much for listening.